The year 1521 marks the fall of the Aztec Empire, overthrown by a horde of plunderers from the seas, the Spanish. The conquistadors took advantage of Emperor Moctezuma II's weakness. But we're forgetting a woman, Malinche. Without this young indigenous slave, who knows if the Spanish would have been able to invade Mexico. Even today, she is accused of betraying her people. So the conquest wasn't just about strong men. Before the arrival of the Spanish, Malinche lived in the south of Mexico in the Yucatan Peninsula. At that time, the Maya dominated the region. They were fearsome warriors and practiced slavery. At the age of 19, Malinche was their prisoner. The eldest daughter of a lord, she was robbed of her inheritance when her father died to the benefit of her younger brother. Stripped of her rights, she was rejected by her family and thus became the slave of a Mayan chief. Her degradation is coupled with constant terror. Among the Maya, like among the Aztecs, slaves and prisoners would often end up sacrificed at the top of a pyramid. Malinche knew that her life was hanging by a thread. But then the unthinkable happened. Unknown ships suddenly arrived on the coast. In March 1519, hundreds of conquistadors landed in Potonchan. They were commanded by a former notary turned adventurer, Hernán Cortés. After participating in the conquest of Cuba, Cortés attacked Mexico with one objective, to line his pockets. Hmm. His arrival panicked the Mayans who dominated the Yucatán. Malinche, on the other hand, saw in this event the long-awaited means of escaping her condition. For her, these foreigners couldn't be worse than her torturers. Her joy was short-lived. The Mayans offered her as a gift to the men from the sea. She who had dreamt of being free remained a slave. The only difference is that with the Spaniards, she was immediately converted to Catholicism. 800 kilometers away is Mexico City. Four centuries ago, it was called Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, and it looked more like this. An architectural jewel covered in pyramids in the middle of a lake surrounded by volcanoes. 200,000 inhabitants. In 1519, Tenochtitlan was one of the most densely populated cities in the world, more than Paris and Rome combined. Moctezuma II lived there, an emperor feared by his people and his adversaries alike. Elected against his will by the nobles, Moctezuma finally acquired a taste for power. He had the right of life and death over 25 million subjects. <laughs> He was a true apparatchik of the Aztec system, a valorous warrior, a tyrannical leader, and a faithful believer in the religion of his ancestors. Emperor Moctezuma was also a seer. But in 1519, when the empire seemed to be at its peak, bad omens were multiplying. The passage of a comet seemed to warn Moctezuma of an imminent disaster. Another prediction announced the return of Quetzalcoatl, a god who had promised revenge after being expelled from Mexico. So when Moctezuma heard that the Spanish had landed, he wondered if he was dealing with this deity. Not to mention that the Aztecs knew nothing of the horses, iron and firearms brought by the Spanish. In other words, they were terrified. A fine tactician, Moctezuma sent a delegation of diplomats to contact the Spanish, who in the meantime had arrived at the borders of the Aztec Empire. The emissaries presented themselves to Cortés with welcome gifts. From afar, Malinche watched the meeting between the Aztecs and the Spanish, but Aguilar, Cortés's translator, only spoke Mayan. He didn't understand a word of Moctezuma's language, Nahuatl. Malinche, on the other hand, understood both languages, so she seized her chance and translated. Her aplomb left everyone stunned. Suddenly, Cortés understood how much he could gain from this slave. Overnight, Malinche's destiny changed. The young woman learnt Spanish and became indispensable as an interpreter. Malinche, with her instinct for survival, knew where her interests lay. She knew the Aztec Empire inside out, especially its weaknesses. So she put her knowledge and intelligence to work in service of the Spanish. This former princess went back to her aristocratic origins. She would soon become a diplomat. Soon she would be leading the meetings with the other natives. 
even influencing Cortés in his decisions, and the conquistador was not insensitive to the young woman's charm. They didn't hide it and never left each other's side. So much so that in the Mexican lands, the rumor spread, a mixed couple is at the head of an army that is destroying everything in its path. August 1519, Malinche and Cortés marched on Tenochtitlan. The road was perilous as they had to cross the independent state of Tlaxcala. The Tlaxcalans attacked the Spanish. At one against 50, Cortés and his men risked succumbing despite the superiority of their weapons. Yes, but... Malinche knew that Tlaxcala was Moctezuma's sworn enemy. She obtained a ceasefire. Without her, the Spanish would have been massacred. Even better, Malinche negotiated an alliance between the conquistadors and the Tlaxcaltecs. In reality, Mexico was divided. Moctezuma may have been the emperor, but he had many enemies at home. The Tlaxcaltecs weren't the only ones who opposed him. There were also the Totonacs and the Mayans. In Tenochtitlan, Moctezuma, who had spies everywhere, followed the progress of the invaders from afar. He was stunned to discover the existence of this diplomat, Malinche, because among the Aztecs, it was forbidden for women to have any political role. So for one of them, a slave in the service of a foreign conqueror, to negotiate with his enemy, the chief of Tlaxcala, what a scandal. His generals urged him to attack, but Moctezuma refused. Always cautious, he feared the curse of Quetzalcoatl. What if Cortés and Malinche were sent by the gods? On the 8th of November 1519, Malinche and the conquistadors quietly entered Tenochtitlan along a two-kilometer causeway. The Aztecs rushed in, fascinated, to see the arrival of these men with skin as white as lime, accompanied by this mysterious slave with exemplary courage. When he discovered Malinche, Moctezuma himself was taken aback by her self-assurance. She spoke to him as an equal. No one had ever dared to do that before. But the emperor still didn't dare to use force. He tried to soften Cortés up by offering gold, convinced that he would go away. But that's definitely not what happened. In Tenochtitlan, Cortés and Malinche settled down. The months went by and the tension mounted. The presence of foreigners was less and less tolerated by the population. In the eyes of his loyal generals, Moctezuma's caution was now seen as weakness. Malinche, who had had to witness human sacrifices, publicly denounced this bloody practice of religion. This was one provocation too many. This time, the emperor went into a rage. The Spanish sensed danger. To regain the initiative, they put a plan in place to stop Moctezuma. Far from defending himself, the emperor allowed himself to be taken as if he considered his death inevitable. Malinche advised him not to rebel if he wanted to avoid the massacre of his people. With the Aztec leader neutralized, Hernán Cortés took the opportunity to get his hands on his fabulous treasure. When they found out, the inhabitants of Tenochtitlan were furious and they revolted. Malinche asked Moctezuma to go and calm things down, but the emperor was stoned to death by his people. And now the conquistadors were caught in their own trap, besieged in the heart of Tenochtitlan. On the night of the 30th of June to the 1st of July, 1520, the invaders tried to escape. But Tenochtitlan was an island, and to get out, you had to cross the famous dike. It was a massacre. Hundreds of Spaniards lost their lives. It was named the Noche Triste, the sad night in Spanish. Malinche and Cortés were among the few survivors. They found refuge with their Tlaxcaltec allies. There, within a few months, Cortés managed to reconstitute an army with the help of Spanish reinforcements from the coast. With Moctezuma dead, the empire slowly sank into anarchy. A year later, with the help of the young woman and the Tlaxcaltecs, the Spanish counterattacked. Tenochtitlan was completely destroyed. It was the end of the Aztec Empire. For Malinche, victory meant peace. She could finally start to enjoy happiness. Her enemies were dead, and in 1522, she gave birth to Martín, the first official mixed-race child, the fruit of her love with Hernán Cortés. It could all end well for her. Except that Cortés, who now ruled the empire, no longer needed her. He left her and erased her from the accounts of the conquest of Mexico. Even worse, he was going to take her son away from her and return to Spain. 
Malinche died, some say of grief, around 1528 in Tenochtitlan, now Mexico City. Five centuries later, history has not forgotten Moctezuma or Malinche, but their example, far from bringing people together, divides Mexicans to this day. For many, Moctezuma, due to his indecision, was responsible for the defeat, while for others, he was the last great indigenous leader, the one who dared to confront the Spanish terror. As for Malinche, despite Cortes's culpable silence, his contemporaries bore witness to her incredible epic. The codexes written and drawn in the 16th century reveal the central role she played in the fall of the Aztec Empire, so modern Mexicans remember her very well. For good or bad, some have made her a legendary heroine. A volcano was named after her. For 21st century feminists, she's even a role model. But for many, Malinche is a chingada, a bad person. In fact, in Mexico, when you want to refer to someone who denies their origins, you say Malinchista. 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 What is certain is that by giving birth to the first mixed-race child, Malinche established herself as the symbolic mother of an entire nation.